You're listening to The Dead Prussian, a podcast about war and warfare. Now, we hear a lot about battles, listeners. We, we understand battles as one of the mechanisms for fighting, and, and, and well, we, we usually assume it's, it's how wars are won. We hear of the decisive battle, you know, the, the can I, the, you know, the, the crazy, well, they didn't completely win the war, I guess they had to go to Argincourt as well. Um, but we hear about these decisive wars, you know, battles in war, like Waterloo. But are they decisive in achieving long-term strategic objectives in a war? Well, I don't know. G'day, listeners, and welcome to the Dead Prussian Podcast. Thanks again for all the support you've been providing us on iTunes, uh, Patreon, and social media. It is always great to hear from our listeners out there in the community. Now, I'm your host, Mick, and my guest today is going to answer the question of why we find battle so alluring. Now, that's a pretty big hint, but you don't have to worry too long for the hint because I am actually just going to introduce my guest. And my guest today to answer the question is Dr. Kahal J. Nolan. He is an Associate Professor of History and Executive Director of the International History Institute at Boston University. He is an award-winning teacher and a scholar of military and international history. His book, A Lure of Battle, A History of How Wars Are Won and Lost, was published by Oxford University Press in 2017. And thank you very much for your support to the show, Oxford University Press. Always enjoy having books sent our way. Now, that book received the Gilda Learman Prize for Military History. The $50,000 prize, which is quite a, quite a worthy prize, perhaps they should have a podcast category. Uh, this prize is co-sponsored by the Gilda Learman Institute of American History and the New York Historical Society. It recognises the book on military history in the English-speaking world, distinguished by its scholarship, its contribution to literature, and its appeal to both general and an academic audience. Now, for listeners out there, it is general, lowercase g. This is not just a book for uh, one, two, three, and four stars. His other books include a two-volume concise history of World War II, for our British listeners, that's the Second World War, uh, Wars of the Age of Louis XIV, and a two-volume study of the Age of Wars of Religion. He consults on military history to the PB series, PBS series Nova and various other documentary films. He is currently writing Decency, Mercy and Honour in War for Oxford University Press. I've already stated how friendly we are with those guys. And interestingly, under the pen name Kali Altsoba, he writes future military fiction. Assassin 2018 is the seventh volume in his Orion War series. Kahal, thanks for coming on the show. Thank you very much for inviting me. Now, Kahal, before we start discussing your book, uh, The Allure of Battle, um, you're one of many books, uh, I'm, also, I'm, I'm really keen to find out how you got interested in studying military history in the first place. Well, as a boy, uh, it was the thing I sort of gravitated to whenever I got off my bike from cycling down to the local library. And uh, it wasn't a very large library. It was in a, in a suburb in Edmonton uh, in Alberta and Western Canada where I grew up. Um, and long winters there. I spent a lot of time in the library. Uh, and I found before I was done that I had kind of devoured all the military history um, there. And that was the thing I gravitated to. Got to college, became a history major, an English major, you know, I had to choose between history and English. And unable to study military history at college. I went to college from 1974 to 78 for my undergraduate. And at that time, it just wasn't offered. Uh, this was the um, sort of the height, well, right in the immediate wake of the Vietnam War. And uh, history departments were downplaying military history more generally, a phenomena that has uh, continued uh, right through the current time where it's very difficult to study military history at college in the United States. Um, even individual courses aren't offered on it, or very rarely. Uh, and it really came back to me uh, when I was teaching uh, here at Boston University in the mid-1990s. And I was teaching courses in 
history of diplomacy and history of the international system and all that kind of thing. I think remember one time I was teaching a course on, on Renaissance diplomacy, and it, it just struck me with force as I listened to myself that I was teaching my students the wrong things. Uh, that um, as much as I could describe the evolution of the Renaissance diplomatic system and how it then transferred into France and became international in the wars of religion and so on, that what really was driving events, what was really driving world history was the wars themselves, and we weren't talking about those. Um, so I proposed uh, to teach a course on military history to my department, which was very reluctant uh, to let me do it. Uh, and uh, have been teaching uh, ever since, and the writing of Allure, in a way, came out of my teaching, um, because after 20 years of teaching military history, I finally wanted to say what I wanted to say the way I wanted to say it, and I was very lucky to have Oxford let me do it that way. It's quite a journey, actually. Um, now, with the world of self-publishing, you probably could just become a military historian without going out and going to uh, university and all those Years of teaching. But I think that's right. In fact, I think most military historians that you meet, now, like for instance, in, 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 uh, most of the military historians that you meet these days are at, in the United States anyway, are at smaller institutions. Um, there's almost no advertised uh, positions. Uh, I wasn't hired as a military historian. I was hired as an international and political historian. And as I say, I had to persuade my department to let me teach uh, these courses. I remember the, um, the when I put the proposal to the to the, the man who was then chairman and I said I'd like to teach a course you know on uh, war and history and he said well it better be war and society um so I said yeah fine that's <laughs> all what I wanted to teach anyway <laughs> so um because this is what the profession has done it is it, it hardly uh, most historians don't read military history hmm. um I had a, a a major a senior colleague a few months ago tell me with not a hint of um, shame that he didn't understand anything at all about the history of war. Wow. And I've got to tell you, I was thinking to myself, well, then how do you claim to understand history? Yeah, I wonder. Because it's at the, cent it's at the center of, of history. I, I wish it wasn't so. I'm not happy to say that, but it's true. And, uh, and I, guess I just got myself in a whole heck of a lot of trouble, you know. If <laughs> yeah, that's all right. I'll, um, I'll make sure I tag in all of Boston University's uh, uh, social media accounts when I publish this, just so, you just so that your, your colleagues know. But uh, your book um, actually focuses on something that's very, um, very interesting to uh, the audience of the show because most of the people who listen to this show that are um, repeat listeners or offenders, uh, as some of them are known to the police mostly, um, they... Uh, they understand the concept of decisive battle, uh, but not all the listeners will. Um, so uh, not everyone who listens to the show will understand the idea of the allure of battle. Now, your book focuses on the difference between tactical wins and strategic successes. That's kind of my uh, podcast reviewer's um, uh, right. uh, summary. So are you able to provide our listeners with a, a bit of a background on the allure of battle? Well, uh, it's the the phrase is one that I'm 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 introducing, and I hope I hope it kind of sticks with a with a, with a more general uh, audience, um, because I think and it's it, I think that what we see the pattern that we see again and again over history, and it's not confined to one nation or one culture. You know, it, there is no single history of war. There is no single history of the world. We have all of these broken up patterns but the one one of them that is out there you know mark twain famously said as you i'm sure your readers know or your listeners know that uh, history does not repeat itself but it rhymes and this is one of the rhymes i think which is that leaders elites are seduced into war hence the title the allure of battle seduced into war by the idea that they can, to mix my metaphors here, they can cut the Gordian knot of all of their problems with the sharp sword of war. They just slice through it. We've been dealing with that border issue for decades. We've been dealing with that obstreperous barbarian population on the margins of the empire for decades. Slice through it. Short, sharp, decisive war. And it almost always goes long. Not always. Not always. There have been decisive battles. There have been decisive wars. I'm not saying that that does not happen. But, and that's actually part of the problem. Because on occasion it actually works, the allure gets greater. So 
So that if, if we can just do it this way, if we can tinker in this direction, if we can manage it that way, if we have a genius general, other con that's the other concept I sort of take on with you know all my claws is the idea of genius in military history. Um, if we can just get it right, we can solve all our problems in a red day, in an afternoon, in a summer's campaign, in a short war. We have example after example of this. By the way, I, I don't I don't mean to step on your toes personally, but at, in the introduction, you you cited three battles. Right? You cited Kenai, Cressy, and Agincourt. None of them were decisive. Excellent. I mean, at Kenai, Hannibal Hannibal had the most quote unquote decisive battle. I mean, and the casualty rates are spectacular. Something like seventy thousand, we think, legionaries were killed, and he lost only five thousand on his side. I mean, absolutely wiped out a Roman army. It was the worst defeat of the Roman army in its history. Uh, the the Roman uh, city citizens actually turned to sacrificing children to appease the gods. That's how much in despair they were, and Hannibal lost the war. He spent the next six, 17 years going up and down the, the, the Italian peninsula. The Romans wouldn't come out and fight him except once or twice. Uh, he was a superior tactician. He could win battles. Battles did not win the war. Instead, the Romans attacked his base of resupply, his, which was then in Spain until ultimately they invaded his homeland in North Africa, where Carthage, as you know, was located, and he was forced to return there, where at the Battle of Zama he was, deceived, he was defeated decisively but after a long war of attrition. Um, at Cressy, of course, the English, one of the opening battles of the Hundred Years' War, well, the name just says it right there. There's my thesis right there, it's the Hundred Years' War. <laughs> All right. And even Agincourt, which has, of course, been made into this, this heroic icon, uh, principally by, by, by two men in modern times, Shakespeare, of course, in Henry V, um, and, uh, and then by, uh, by, by Churchill, who I think in his history of English-speaking peoples also elevated these battles. This is nationalist history, um, royalist and nationalist history. But of course, Agincourt, did the English decisively defeat the French at Agincourt? Yes. Who won the Hundred Years' War? France. <laughs> I mean, Joan of Arc comes after Agincourt. The expulsion of the British from Gascony and Normandy comes after Agincourt. The British are expelled from the continent and reduced to a minor power for about 150 years, falling into their own civil war, the Wars of the Roses, after Agincourt. It's not decisive. But it did have um, lead to Kenneth Branagh playing uh, Henry V, so, uh, you know, it's, it's not all I mean, bad. But, uh, no, I, no, it's I, wonderful. It's wonderful. I, yeah. I guess, listeners, you can probably... Uh, you can probably guess that I need to go back and do a little bit more reading on my battles, so I can pick. I should pick up this book again and give it another read. Now. No, because okay, everybody. I think that's the way military history is presented. It's presented as a sequence of um, decisions that are take place because of the application of brilliance by a general uh, or a tactical system on an afternoon or a summer's campaign. I think that's the way we all learn. It's the way I learned military history. It's the way, it's the way we learn it. Um, I just think it is mostly wrong. I mean, let me, let me, let me if, if, if you don't mind sort of playing the game, let me ask you what the decisive battle was that, uh, of the second world war. Well, there wasn't one. There was just, uh, they just ran out exactly. of stuff, right? Exactly. It's. I mean, it's. It's a. It's a long six-year war of a. I mean, if you if you ask that question in a large group, someone's going to put up their hand and say Stalingrad. Um, and you might get one or two others, Kursk, and you know things like that, Midway. Uh, but in fact, each of those battles, if you look at them closely, accelerated the rate of attrition, which was the underlying cause of the defeat of the uh, opposing power. That would be my argument. Well, then let's let's dig a bit more into this decisive battle idea. So you, you've discussed the concept of decisive battle. You've torn apart all of my arguments, which is fine. My listeners will love that. Um, now, you, you highlight how it's dominated military thought. In, in fact, even popular culture, I suppose, um, particularly since, uh, since the Renaissance period. Now, what actually yes. is decisive battle? Well, I mean, the whole the term is is the idea that the outcome of the war of which the battle is a key event, that the outcome of the war is decided on the battlefield that day, whether it was um, at Canai or Agincourt or Marignano or Waterloo or uh, name the battle, uh, Blenheim. Um, you can go on and on. There's just Poltava. There's so many of these famous famous battles. 
Um, and we have a, a long tradition of this because in the 19th century in particular, following Napoleon, who was your dead Prussians were partly responsible for this, elevated to, in the words of Clausewitz, quote, the god of war, end quote. Um, the idea that decisive battle uh, is the only really proper way to make war. Uh, that what you should do is you should you get your army in a war, you go out, you seek out where is the enemy's uh, main formation, you seek it out, you envelop it, you destroy it. Uh, and then you win, except you don't win. Uh, you only win the battle, you might win the campaign, you might win the summer, but these wars among the major powers, once the empires are engaged in wars, once larger, I'm not talking about two small countries fighting where you might win in an, in an afternoon, but where two major empires are fighting, say the Greeks and the Persians, or um, the British and the French uh, in the Napoleonic period. Uh, the, the idea of winning in a summer's campaign, winning in a short uh, period, is not only a delusion, it's a dangerous delusion, which will pull you into longer wars where the empires grind each other down. And the metaphor I use maybe too often in the book is like sumo wrestlers. Um, and, and one finally falls or is thrown from the sand pit, you know, in exhaustion, usually just before the other one was about to. Yeah. There's kind of a mutual erosion and exhaustion. And we think of attrition and we think of wars of attrition and we all would think of World War I, which is kind of the classic, you know, in the modern mind, the classic war of attrition. We think of, of French warfare and so forth. But World War II was even more an attritional fight with higher rates of attrition. Um, but punctuated by more open field battles or battles inside cities, things we name battles because it helps us kind of a shorthand for understanding the event. But they're really these dramatic accelerations of, of, of attritional wearing down of the enemy until finally something cracks. It's interesting. The, uh, you, you've, you, hopefully you've shattered all of our all of our theories out there. And if, if you haven't, well, at least people can pick up the book. Um, yeah, you know, because we all know that um, some of the longest wars in history, such as, you know, uh, and I'm not talking about um, all of history, I'll talk about recent history, you know, Vietnam and the, uh, the conflict in uh, Afghanistan, yeah. they, were, they were solved pretty quickly with decisive battles. So, you know, that's, that's a good counterpoint. Um, you, you also discuss the idea that material and moral attrition is key determinant of victory in wars between great powers. And, you know, you talk about uh, the First World War as, as, as a well-known example of uh, attrition being a key component. Um, if this is the case, uh, why why is a decisive battle more alluring? I mean, if, if we know that World War One was won through attrition, you know, that kind of set the, the game pretty, you know, it's a scoreboard uh, winner, that one. And then, you know, World War Two is pretty much the same. Um, so why is the idea of battle uh, so alluring? Well, because it suggests is particular to the weaker power, which knows if it gets in a long war of attrition, it's more likely to lose. It suggests a way out of the cul-de-sac, a way out of the, the trap of material war, of a war of, of material and attrition and morale and exhaustion. Um, so uh, I think, for example, in the 20th century, that the, the powers that were most easily seduced into the, 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 by the idea of the short war were the Germans and the Japanese. I think they're, the Germans uh, twice, I mean, in 1939, it's, it's, it's a virtual repeat of 1914. I mean, the classic idea, the, 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 the extraordinary hubris of the German idea in 1914 that they could defeat an entire great power in 42 days, swing their army across the continent on the railways and defeat an even larger great power. That actually, I mean, if you look at that, it looks like, and the way it's usually portrayed is arrogance. And um, and then you certainly find enough Germans to quote that sounded arrogant on any given day that that, that that argument seems to hold. But if you look more closely, it was a response of desperation and fear um, and striking to try and get at least one, more, you know, the classic German dilemma of, of feeling surrounded. They used to call it the ring of steel and they needed to feel secure on at least one border. So they strike hard. Um, and they just, they got pulled into a long war that they knew they could not win. They knew they couldn't win it, which is why the short war is the only other option. You've got two choices. If you are a power that wants to rise as they did to Weltmacht, to world power status, your option is 
we go for a short war, and we persuade ourselves we can win it because we're militarily uh, we're professional, we're more professional, we're superior in our doctrine, we have a natural talent for war, a genius for war, all of those things, or, or a Satian spirit, the Japanese call this, or whatever you can persuade yourself makes you superior, morally superior at war. I'll give you an example from American history. Confederates used to say, um, you know, one good rebel is worth five damn Yankees. No, he wasn't. Uh, n not in the end. Uh, they were worn down. They were they were ground down. Uh, so your other option is so you either have um, you either strike hoping to win it all fast, knowing that if it goes long, you are almost certainly going to lose, or you give up war as an instrument of your national ambition. And they were not prepared culturally to do that. Neither the Germans nor the Japanese, nor many others. Does that make sense? It does. It does. And uh, listeners, if it doesn't make sense, buy the book. Um, now, my final question on this idea of, uh, of, of battle uh, being alluring, uh, as the listeners can tell, I'm, I'm using uh, your title as much as I can because it's, it's, oh. it's just a great title. Um, and it also uh, means that I can be lazy in the way that I write and frame my questions. But um, what I want to know is... Uh, you point out all these um, key historical moments where battle has proven not to be the decisive factor. So, you know, now we've got we've got your book out there. Um, it's an award winner, so people should be reading it. Um, have we seen the end of the the allure of decisive battle in modern warfare? No, I don't believe so. Um, I, I I hope I'm completely wrong. Uh, I don't think I am, but I, I would very much like to be completely wrong. Um, you, you, you still see the short war delusion. You see it, as you always saw it, more among the politicians, the civilians than among the military. Um, without naming names, I, I, was, I, was brought, I, I was asked that to go out to, to uh, speak briefly, which I thought was a waste of their time, actually, at Fort Leavenworth at the command school uh, in 2017 when the book first came out. And I, a series of seminars over three days, uh, and mostly they were briefing me about things. And in, in one group was the uh, group that was writing the lessons learned of Afghanistan and, uh, and, and the Iraq wars. Extraordinarily sharp. These people are extraordinarily sharp. Um, and the colonel leading the group was particularly engaging. And I, I was feeling way too cheeky. And I asked him, well, have you learned any lessons? This guy was sharp as a knife, didn't miss a microsecond. And his immediate answer to me was, and I quote, we have, the politicians have not, end quote. Hmm. That's, uh... Uh, by the way, at that same uh, event, uh, it would, in a general Q&A, I asked this group of al almost all serving officers or very senior uh, civilians, ex almost all ex-military or active duty military, major rank and, and higher. Uh, and I asked them if they would concede that they were engaged in a new 30 years war. Nobody blinked. So I pushed it and said, what about a hundred years war? There was certainly, I don't know how, if it was a majority, but there were people in the room that were prepared to contemplate that. We're in the 20th year of a 30 years war since 20, uh, 2001. We're in the 20th year already. There's no end in sight. But the good news is only 10 more years to go, right, if it's a 30 year war. Yeah, but we've also had in history a 80 years war and a 100 years <laughs> war. You know, I mean, uh, the, you, could, you can look at the Arab-Israeli wars and consider them a 70 years war and counting. And I mean, how many wars in the modern period? People have just forgotten. They've been fighting in Myanmar for over 45 years. The Afghan war did not start in uh, 2001. It started in 1978. If you count the fighting that then the Soviets moved in in 79 and they were there for a decade and then the fighting resumed and then NATO went in and we're still there and the, we pull out, the fighting will continue. It's an endless war. The Vietnam Wars, not the American, the war that Americans call the Vietnam War, but the wars in Indochina really started in 1940 and they weren't over till 1992. That's 52 years of continuous war by the peoples of Vietnam. They fought the Japanese, they fought the French, they fought each other, they fought the Americans, then they fought each other again, then they fought the Chinese, and then irony of ironies, the Vietnamese invaded Cambodia and involved, were engaged in a, well, however many years long, uh, guerrilla war against Khmer Rouge. 
Well, yeah, I mean, you, it just goes on. If people stop coming to fight you, you're eventually going to have to go out and fight others, right? Yes. Um, so, Kahal, it's it's almost time for the bonus question. But before, uh, actually, it is time for the bonus question, and then after that, it'll be time for the final question, which is uh, I like to say, Tim, you'll be familiar with the butcher's bill for coming on the show. All right, Kahal, my final question is one I ask of all guests. It relates to our mission on the show to define war in as many ways as possible, just like Big Carl the Dead Prussian himself did. Uh, it helps us define and debate about war, which is one of society's most costly endeavours. Now, I ask each guest to finish a sentence. So right now, I'm going to ask you to finish the sentence, war is... War is the expression of human vanity on the grand scale. Wow, that's a, that's a brilliant one. One, it fits in a tweet, which is excellent. And uh, it is after, you know, this, this episode of yours will be episode number 80. So it fits um, in the original category as well. I don't think we've had someone with uh, such a, an original answer. Um, that is brilliant, ladies and gents. Hopefully you've enjoyed our uh, discussion today. Um, please uh, join me in thanking Kahal for coming on the show. That means I want you clapping in your cars, on the subway, wherever you're listening to the podcast, on the treadmill. Be careful if you're doing it on the treadmill, but clap along. Not, not, not in your cars, not in well, your cars. Right. Oh, not in your cars. Um, well, I've got a responsible guest, but Kahal, thank you very much for coming on the show. Thank you very much for the invitation. Now, ladies and gents, please support Kahal by going out there and buying this uh, fantastic book. It, as I said, it's published by Oxford University Press, and uh, they have you know, a brilliant range of books over there. But uh, if you're going to start with one of their books, start with this one. It's in paperback now for those of you who are cheapskates and don't want the hardcover version. Then, And I say that lovingly because I have a, uh, a, a paperback version. I've actually got a paperback version of your copy, so I'm cheaper than you. Uh, but you can click on the show notes in the link and you'll be able to find uh, a um, portal to our Amazon shop to buy the book in whatever format uh, you prefer. Uh, also, um, make sure you keep an eye out for Kahal's work. And if you are looking for something uh, less academic to read, make sure you check out his fiction series, which is the Orion War series. But listeners... Until next time, grab a book and crack on. Join the conversation with us on Twitter at Dead Prussian Pod, on Facebook at The Dead Prussian Page, or on our website www.thedeadprussian.com. All show notes for this episode, as well as copyright information, can be found on the website. The Dead Prussian Podcast is written, produced, and hosted by Mick Cook. It is co-produced by Amanda Levito. The music used throughout is Caught in the Beat by Broke for Free and is used under a Creative Commons attribution license. All opinions expressed by individuals on the podcast are those of the individual and not necessarily representative of any other organisation.